Let's please welcome Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, I've learned from hosting a few of these myself that the evaluations are much higher when people leave at the beginning. Though, but yeah, so <laughs> this is my, you know, key to the strategy here. Um, just to let you know where we are in this research project, um, this was a survey that we commissioned with CARA that we finished uh, last June. And so this is really the first or second presentation of these findings. And um, we're going to start phase two pretty soon. So I'm very interested in your feedback in helping me understand of this data what's, what's interesting, what's relevant, what should I focus on, um, because it's easy to get lost in a report that's this thick, which is available for anyone to read. So if you love charts and graphs, there's no shortage of those in this uh, report. To tell you a little bit how the project started, this is uh, a graph of the total number of incensions in the U.S. going back to 1816 and their arrival all the way up to uh, 2013. So you can see it, it goes up and it goes down. There are many incensions today as there were in 1920. Um, having this conversation with Father Ed Udovic, my, uh, my boss in Mission and Values, We've had this conversation probably a couple times since my, my time working at DePaul, but there's never really been an in-depth study of um, the personnel history of the Vincentians in the U.S., so that's one thing we're preparing for in uh, 2016, which is the 200th anniversary of their arrival. So we're going to do a, a thorough study of Vincentian personnel. But the question always, um, if this graph continues to go down, what does the future look like? And that's a question that is of um, interest to a lot of people. So that's really how this um, project came about. Um, Father Ed has been doing this for years, and this was at a time before Excel and charts and all that. Uh, you see the same trend lines. It goes up, it goes down. Uh, the different divisions in this is the uh, gradual growth and contraction of the Vincentian family in the U.S. in terms of provinces. So we see um, you know, accounting uh, for that reality from a personnel perspective it gets a little bit tricky. So this is uh, where it started, and this um, is in uh, Father Ed's personnel file um, just down the hall. This trend uh, in the Vincentian family is by no means unique. Um, this is a trend of religious life facing uh, the Catholic Church in the United States. You can see, um, I apologize that this gets cut off, on the left-hand side, but in 1965, there were 250,000 total vowed religious. Uh, in 2014, there are 92,000, so that's a significant decrease. Um, the largest, one of the largest decreases is among religious sisters, 179,000 in 1965. Today, there are 49,000. Um, and you can see that the trend lines for diocesan priests and religious priests is uh, also in decline, but not as significant as uh, religious sisters. So this is a, a context that's facing the Catholic Church in the U.S. in general. Uh, but it's important uh, to locate the Vincentian story within that trend line. Uh, this gets cut off as well. Uh, the Midwest province age distribution in 19... 85 is fairly even across decades. So ages 25 to 34, um, then you see age 35 to 44, 45 to 54, and so on. This is uh, what you'd call a, a, a normal distribution, a normal in the sense that um, you know, as, as each decade or generation gets older, there is another generation to replace it. But if you look at this distribution in 2014, um, ages 65 and older, those two categories, is a significant proportion of the Vincentian family. And we see that um, ages 25 to 34 and ages 35 to 44 um, are not entering at the same rate. So this, um, we, uh, when we look at this phenomenon, it's, we call it diminishment, and there are really three sources of diminishment. One is um, Vincentians die, so that's you know sort of natural diminishment faces any human being who's alive. Uh, but there's also a number who have left. Um, 
uh, the Vincentian border. And the third reason is uh, fewer entrants. So those are those three causes, and there are multiple, uh, those are the three primary factors of diminishment. So what's the context of this, or, or why does this matter? Uh, Father Ed published an article in 2005 projecting forward, if these trends continue, that in 2023, um, this will uh, continue to impact DePaul. It has already significantly, but will continue to do so. It's likely that uh, DePaul will have first lay president some, sometime between now and then. Uh, it may be that there isn't any of incentive presence on campus or you know, one or two. There may be no Vincentians on the board of trustees or members of the corporation. This is a challenge because in our bylaws it requires a Vincentian presence in the members of the corporation. Um, Catholic Healthcare has um, done a lot with this challenge. They have talked about new corporate structures of public juridic person in canon law. Uh, Catholic higher ed is behind the curve uh, when compared to Catholic healthcare. But these are institutional questions that aren't unresolvable, but they're significant. Um, so we wonder what the Vincentian presence will be and what would DePaul look like without a Vincentian governance uh, presence in the, in the governance structure. Is it possible that DePaul could lose its canonical sponsorship or that may become irrelevant um, in a period of time? That question is uh, one that Father Holschneider has studied uh, significantly, and there's no guarantee that um, just because a religious order founded a university that that uh, presence will remain there. Um, so a lot of Catholic universities have decided when their governance structure changes that it's not important to have canonical sponsorship, and then they just become private universities um, with the same market forces that affect Catholic universities. So this question is, um, there's a, a significant uh, time period to, to address this question. And really, it, um, there are, are lots of institutional challenges to this. So this is uh, some of the context for why we contracted CARA uh, to study this, this group of people on affiliated labor extensions. Here's how we define the group. Um, young adults between the ages of 18 to 35. There's nothing magical about this age group um, other than that's consistent with research on <coughs> Catholic generations uh, and the broader research on uh, millennial generations. So we wanted to be consistent with that age group so we can make some meaningful comparisons. Uh, but the difference is uh, this group of people who've had a formative experience in the Vincentian mission, either as a student at a Vincentian university or as a postgraduate volunteer at a Vincentian University, or both. So those are the, that's the key uh, population. We sent the survey out to 1,700 people. Uh, the end, the big end of this group is probably larger, significantly larger. This was skewed both uh, because of our focus on DePaul. Um, we didn't have as many survey respondents from St. John's or Niagara, not because there was any claim about uh, Vincentian commitment or Vincentian charism there, but because executing a survey requires a list of names and someone has to decide what is or isn't, uh, cons what does or doesn't constitute um, you know, a formative experience in the Vincentian mission. And we just didn't have the institutional <laughs> knowledge of those two other schools. Um, and so it required, um, it, it just made the survey much more complicated. So I'll fully admit that this is heavily skewed by uh, DePaul's experience. Uh, we had a response, 20% response rate, uh, 351. So it's important to keep these numbers um, in, in the back of our minds as we, as we move forward. I want to put this in context of um, millennial Catholics. Uh, this is a very significant period of transition in the Catholic Church. There's been a lot of research uh, out there, so I'm just going to give a, a brief review of some of it. The first one, um, American Catholics in Transition, uh, Mary Gauthier was one of the co-authors. She also helped with this survey out at CARA. CARA is the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown, and this is really the forte in expertise. <coughs> So religious affiliation in the United States, you'll see, is um, fairly consistent for Catholics. 22% uh, affiliate with the Catholic Church. This is 1945. Today, it's 
you'll see the significant decline among Protestant Christian denominations um, from 70% to 52%. But what's interesting is the gray line here, and that's what we call the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people that don't affiliate with any religious tradition. So that went from 3% in 1945 up to 18% uh, currently. So that's a significant growth. Uh, that's an important context uh, to understand as well. Change in uh, Catholic population in parishes uh, just from 2001 to 2011 is significant. This might be hard for you to see, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what the colors mean. The red means a overall decline of 50,000 or more. Yellow means a decline of zero to 50,000. Green is an increase less than 25,000. Light blue is 25 to 100,000 increase. And dark blue is more than 100,000. Now, I'm terrible with colors, so I might not be describing these colors right, but hopefully you get the idea. <laughs> Notice the areas of yellow and red are in, for the most part, in the Midwest, but mainly in New England. This is where the Catholic infrastructure is in terms of <coughs> universities, hospitals, parishes. We look at the West, this is a significant growth in the Catholic population that does not have the same Catholic infrastructure in terms of universities and parishes. If we could drill down and focus, Chicago is yellow, but the suburbs are blue. So there's been a lot of movement from uh, the inner city in Chicago out to the suburbs in terms of Catholic populations. Some people have coined the term uh, kind of ghetto Catholicism or immigrant Catholicism, and we know um, in Catholic experience that um, this was a, a significant part of the early uh, you know, growth of the Catholic Church um, was, was focused on uh, migration patterns. And that's still the case today, but it's important to uh, keep this context in mind. So I'll cover now a little bit the, the generational research, and just uh, to be clear with definitions, the silent generation, which is here in a Catholic context called the pre-Vatican II generation, is people who were born between 1925 and 1942. Uh, they're called the silent generation in broader generational research, um, largely because their formative experience was in the 50s, where it was important to sit in your desk and uh, not cause too much trouble. The Vatican II generation consists of people born between 1943 and 1960, so this was a formative experience. Uh, Vatican II was a formative experience for this generation. Um, the next generation was born between 1961 and 1982. That's called uh, Generation X, um, or the post-Vatican II in Catholic generational research. And the latest is uh, the millennial Catholics, and they were born between 1979 in 1993. So among Catholic generations, the, um, the makeup, the profile, the diversity is significantly different between if we compare pre-Vatican II Catholics with millennial Catholics. It goes from 96% non-Hispanic white to 50%. Um, so that's a significant change in demographic in, in Catholic practices, Catholic identity. Um, and so this is a, a significant context when we talk about uh, generational differences. 1987, roughly a third, uh, it's divided in, in roughly a third between uh, pre-Vatican II, post-Vatican II, and Vatican II. And notice in 1987, there isn't a single person in the millennial generation. They didn't know what that generation was in 1987. It had yet to be defined. Whereas in 2011, this is a full 23%. Catholics. Mass attendance has been on uh, the decline significantly uh, for a few decades. And we notice um, in mass attendance, or of mass attendance, 58% are pre Vatican II. 30% are post Vatican II. And that was in 1987. In 2011, the millennial generation, only 23% um, attend Mass weekly, compared to 54% in pre-Vatican II. 
So this decline in weekly mass attendance is significant from over 50% in 1965 to uh, low 20% or mid 20% by 2014. The sharpest decline has been among women. So 52% in 1985 attended mass weekly. That's down to 30, 31%, which is roughly equal to uh, men who attend mass weekly. As uh, many researchers have, they drill down a little bit further into what constitutes their Catholic identity. And you can see there's a significant difference between Hispanic and non-Hispanic but also items that some uh, generationally might think are central are not as central for millennial Catholics. So there's, this is a, yet another important context to keep in mind when we talk about um, unaffiliated lay concessions because they are largely millennials. Christian Smith uh, is a sociologist of religion at Notre Dame. He's done uh, a lot of significant work um, he coined the term moralistic therapeutic deism in his book Soul Searching in 2005. This was a follow-up to that. His take, as, as I read uh, his work, is uh, this, he says, the story of most previous research on young Catholics, in short, is largely one of decline and loss. I would position his research in this way, too, uh, in the context of a narrative of decline. There is something that is being lost from pre-Vatican II Catholics to uh, millennials. The term moralistic therapeutic deism is not one of self-description among millennials, but roughly described, it's the notion that a creator God wants people to be, <coughs> to be nice, excuse me, to feel happy. This God does not need to be involved in one's life to any significant degree, and good people go to heaven just because that's the way things work. Um, he did roughly 2,000 teen interviews. Uh, the, this is the, the source that this data comes from. In this book, Young Catholic Americans, um, he shares the descriptors of this group of people. Very selective in their beliefs and practices, loosely tethered is a phrase he uses to describe their relationship with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is one denomination among many others as a system of voluntary participation. They adhere to a general Catholic identity, but one among others. And they're unable to articulate a coherent account of what it means to be Catholic. So this is uh, the findings from the generational research on millennial Catholics. So that's the context that we begin this unaffiliated Lave and Sension research project. One of the most significant things to note is that of the respondents, 78% were female. And this is largely consistent with uh, other findings of volunteer networks. Um, it's a predominantly uh, uh, female population. So this is, um, this is important to uh, keep in mind because uh, this in a way goes against that narrative of decline of religious participation or weekly mass attendance that we find in the broader uh, Catholic Church. Age of respondents largely 25 to uh, 29, some 30 to 34. This isn't much of a surprise because this is how we defined the population. Predominantly unmarried uh, compared to the U.S. population. Uh, this is also a function of the uh, age that we're talking about. So this group largely is uh, single women without children, if we had to describe it uh, you know, in terms of a, a majority. But they are highly educated compared to the broader U.S. population. So the blue is the ULV population behind it, and the red is the U.S. adult population. So this is their highest level of education, a bachelor's degree, about 40%. Almost an equal number of uh, respondents have a master's degree. Significant amount have a professional degree. 
all total, uh, greater than a bachelor's degree um, is more than uh, you know mid 40 percent. So this is significant when compared to the U.S. adult population. Many of them come from Catholic universities, 72 percent. Their current occupation, if we look at uh, the bottom three, between community and social service, education and healthcare, constitutes a majority of the professional careers uh, of this population. And combined income when compared to the US population. Uh, hopefully this isn't uh, a long-term trend and that this is more <laughs> age appropriate because otherwise I think we're in trouble, and they're in trouble on lots of fronts. So those are some of the basic demographics of this population. Where do they live? Fortunately, we have a geography department and students who can do GIS mapping, so I sent um, a list of zip codes, and um, David Sementico is a, a geography uh, undergrad student and he created this map. So the dark red, not surprisingly, is uh, um, you know the disproportionate influence of DePaul. But we can see that they're spread out all over the country with significant populations um, in various places. Another interesting point is that of uh, um, the respondents know that they live within a 45 minute drive of Society of St. Vincent de Paul, 81%, and 59% are aware that they are within a 45-minute drive of Vincentians, Daughters of Charity, and other members of the Vincentian family. So uh, they have some familiarity that there, is, there are other members of the Vincentian family uh, that live nearby. So now we get into the findings uh, and, and what, what I think is significant about these. 76%, so in the front, the blue is how they were raised, and the red is how they currently self-identify. 76% were raised Roman Catholic, but only 66% currently self-identify as Roman Catholic. So that means that 40, some 34%, if you can help me with my math, do not self-identify as Catholic currently. So this is um, a particular challenge that I'll address in a little bit. One of the significant growths, uh, the nuns, 3% were raised as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, 13% uh, currently self-identify, more so than other um, religious traditions. So that's the second most self, um, that's the, the second largest uh, self-identification category is none. Religious service attendance, Blue is the ULV population, red is the US adult population. I apologize, I flipped the X axis on this if you ever do this kind of graph work. So the zero always belongs on the left and I am left-handed so I mix that up. Uh, but you'll notice that between weekly mass attendance and two to three times per month, not just mass attendance, sorry, religious service attendance, is significantly larger than the broader US adult population. <clears throat> Many millennials describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. That's not true with this population. They describe themselves, by 70% uh, describe themselves as religious and spiritual. So we ask this as a, um, you know, a, a fill in the blank, uh, not fill in the blank, uh, a survey question where they just pick one of these categories. But then we also asked an open-end question, please explain. So this is um, phase two of a research project is going to go through these findings and what are the categories, how do people understand the meaning of religious compared to the meaning of spiritual. But it's a positive finding in my mind that they identify positively with both, that both terms are meaningful to them. 70% of the respondents find both terms meaningful. And a significant portion, 46%, has considered a vocation to religious life. <clears throat> so
So we wanted to understand what were some of the markers of incension formation. If we had to identify a number of categories, what would those be? So these are the categories that we came up with. The blue represents what was communicated to them in their programs. And we added, uh, it was communicated very much or somewhat. We added those two together to create a general um, you know, positive. And then um, the other two, a general negative, uh, is the, would be the difference. The red represents how important these things are in making uh, life choices. So this is largely either during the program, but, but mainly afterward. <coughs> So service and solidarity with the poor, almost 100% communicated that this was an important dimension of their incension experience and that it's important on their life choices. <coughs> Social justice and sy systemic change is significant. But serving with community, it was communicated that it was important, but you'll <coughs> notice a significant drop off. It is not important in their current life choices. Living simply, ongoing reflection and prayer. Vincentian heritage was communicated to them, but less than 40% believe that it's important to them now in making life choices. Catholic social teaching was higher than I had expected, um, but you still see a, a drop off, as with the other categories, between what was communicated and uh, what continues to remain important in their life choices. The last one, sacraments, um, is consistent with the generational research among millennial Catholics. Sacraments in general and mass attendance in particular do not hold the same place in terms of constructing a Catholic identity as it does with older uh, generations of Catholics. This was uh, an interesting finding too, that their experience um, as an unaffiliated lay of incension also had an impact in the relationship with their partner. So they um, oftentimes tend to uh, have a partner who shares many of the same uh, beliefs and values. Unaffiliated lay incensions uh, somewhat or strongly agree that they are still in contact with other unaffiliated lay incensions, that the mission had a significant influence on their career, that they would like to be more involved with the Vincentian family, and more than 60% would be interested in exploring a formal relationship with the Vincentian family in some capacity. So looking forward, we asked, we wanted to understand uh, what kinds of engagement would be of interest. <clears throat> So the red represents interest in being involved in these things. The blue represents how they are currently involved. So the Daughters of Charity have an associates program. 29% expressed interest in that, but 2% are currently involved. We go down to the bottom. 74% uh, are interested in volunteer work, but only 37% are currently involved. So the percentages are one thing, but when we look about the total numbers, so of the 351 respondents not currently involved, this is the number that is interested in an associates program. A hundred people are interested in an associates program for the Daughters of Charity. 129 are interested in family retreats, youth gatherings, prayer and faith sharing, social activities, and 259 of the 351 are interested in uh, further volunteer opportunities. So this is, um, this is a sizable group of people considering the, uh, the smaller uh, population that, we're, uh, that we surveyed. So these are some of the things that uh, came up frequently. The one thing I would like to see the Vincentian family organize in my area is, and you can see in their own words, short-term volunteer opportunities, volunteer opportunities for families, service with reflection or education, <clears throat> social events, networking events, young adult groups, and so on. The 
they're interested in these particular types of resources and opportunities, social justice and systemic change resources. So this is a prominent theme in the Vincentian family. There's an interest and a hunger for um, these kinds of resources for uh, unaffiliated lay Vincentians. Resources about effective methods of service and short-term mission projects, almost 80% are interested in that kind of opportunity that they currently are not finding. So that gives you a sense of what they are looking for. So what must be done? What could be done about this? I would suggest the first thing is to move from a narrative of decline, which categorizes this research of millennial Catholics, um, to move from this narrative of decline to a narrative, narrative of opportunity. Um, I think this would change the dynamic of the conversation significantly. But it also means rethinking some of the meanings of incension, the adjective incension, in light of changing views about Catholic identity in general and the role of Eucharist and mass attendance in particular as one uh, specific area. This is significant given the number of people who do not self-identify as Catholic or people who do self-identify as Catholic but do not attend Mass frequently. This is just a different composition of Catholic identity than uh, previous generations of Catholics. Um, and somehow that needs to be addressed in a Vincentian context. From a more practi pra <coughs> excuse me, practical perspective, uh, engaging and partnering with unaffiliated lay Vincentian uh, this community in service to the poor, uh, in community, in a lifelong process of ongoing lay formation. I think of the formation for Jesuits, which is um, 10, 11 years. They start with novitiate, uh, get an advanced degree in philosophy, regency, usually teaching in a Jesuit high school, go on to study theology, then they get ordained. You compare that to the formation for lay people, which is virtually non-existent. So there's a significant disparity between formation in religious orders, and this is true even in the Vincentian tradition, and formation for uh, the laity in, in the same religious charism. There just are not the same resources, <coughs> opportunities, um, or community uh, to do it. So when I think about Vincentian heritage, um, 2017 will mark the 400th anniversary of the first sermon of the Congregation of the Mission that Vincent Duval gave on January 17, 1617. I wonder what sermon Vincent de Paul would give today. What is the, the need that would catch his attention that he would, um, you know, what would he preach about today? Or if Louise de Marillac had to talk about pressing needs, what would she talk about? One of the markers of the Vincentian charism, I think, is a Vincentian theological understanding, what might be framed as encountering Christ in the poor. Um, how might we retain that understanding while also acknowledging that a significant portion does not self-identify uh, as Catholic or even Christian? Uh, among the nuns, people who don't self-identify with any religious tradition, how do we retain that that central theological insight about encountering uh, the poor in meaningful ways. The Vincentian family has been doing this kind of work for centuries uh, with men and women and lay people. Uh, so this really isn't asking anything new of the Vincentian family. In fact, it's something that they've been doing for a very long time. Think of the Daughters of Charity uh, and their work in healthcare as an opportunity for young adults to encounter this heritage and to be formed in this tradition. Uh, the Vincentian story of personalism, I think in many ways, is uh, significant and perhaps unique. So how does that get transmitted to a new generation of unaffiliated lay Vincentians? This is a painting by Pablo Picasso, uh, Science and Charity, in 1897. Kind of reminds me of the early Society of St. Vincent de Paul uh, working directly in service to the poor alongside uh, the daughters. And this is uh, a significant part of the history and heritage of the Vincentian family. So 
So this is uh, what we found, uh, why I think it's significant, and I'd love to hear your comments or questions. I don't know yet. <laughs> he hasn't heard it. Well, he knows the report. He's seen the report. Um, I presented it to the Vincentian family last week. I think a lot of people have been thinking about this for a long time, but someone afterwards said, thank you for studying this. I don't, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, but I don't think there's been a lot of research into this group. So I, um, but in terms of what it means going forward, I don't, that's, the, that's unresolved. So are there, are there different faiths or different areas where people have tried to re-engage cradle Catholics or people who have, you know, millennials who have gone away and have these programs come back to effective? I mean, in essence, are you trying to replicate something that's gone before or is this sort of novel? Yeah, good question. There's a whole range of things. Um, what I would call on the high end of formal association would be like a third order, secular Franciscans. They've been doing this for a very long time. On the low end of formal engagement, you have things that are um, you know, essentially the initiative of lay people, like Sant'Egidio is an example of a faith community that's really focused on service and work um, and, and doesn't have, um, you know, it, it invites members of religious um, orders to come and join Santa Gidio. So it's, it's a very different organizational structure. And then you have associates programs. There's Ignatian associates in the Wisconsin province of the Jesuits. Um, they've started to do this. Uh, so it's really a function of what this group of people want in terms of their commitment to uh, a formal association and what the Vincentian family is willing to invest in creating these structures of formation. Um, on one hand, you could say that the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, this was you know, an initiative of lay people, they did this and didn't need permission or blessing from anyone, they sort of claimed it and did it. Um, but on the other hand, we've seen that model fail a number of times without significant investment and direction. So, um, and there's everything in between. So I think part of uh, maybe the next phase in this research is to um, do focus groups, figure out what this group of people want in terms of a formal relationship, and then lay out an array of models and, and see which one uh, might make sense, or which ones might make sense. I decided to think of uh, the variety of things, because my experience of working um, with the Vincentian family, both in the young adult arena, as well as with the Ladies of Charity, the Women's Football Society, who are now getting up there in years, um, you know, that that their attraction to the Vincentian family is different. And so I think the more opportunity that we can uh, provide for them, the better. And I think that there are some great efforts right now. The Vincentian Lady Missionaries will, I think it's this year, have 100 people who have been to Kenya and Ethiopia. And they still stay connected because as one of them said to me two years ago, you know, I can talk about this experience with my friends and with my family, and <coughs> but, you know, they don't connect because they had not had the experience, and I have to keep that being kindled in my soul. So they come back to do that together. So, you know, for them that was a fabulous experience. <coughs> here in the city of Chicago, if we can get something working around the, you know, working with the Paul University with the homeless students that are here and the Ascension Family rallying around that effort, you know, there might be opportunities for all of our organizations because now the, the same society is in Paul here in Chicago heard about that and are more interested now in looking at the Ascension Family. I think it's just slow, slow work, but I think in time, you know, it will come around. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I thought it was a, a wonderful.
presentation, and, <clears throat> and you brought together a tremendous amount of material and presented it uh, in a clarifying way. What I, uh, I would say that I think one of the challenges that you brought forth and you highlighted it is that connecting the the extension affiliation with the fact that that there's a different definition of what it means to be Catholic or what it means to be, and, and especially the distance from sacramental life. Uh -huh. And I think that's a, a very important issue, um, and an important issue, because um, the uh, can the Vincentian family be a big enough tent that it's going to be able to serve the poor while allowing people to, to um, define some of these things for themselves, which is the way the church is going even um, uh, you know, within the church itself, we see that people are learning to take control of their moral life and make self-actualized moral decisions that are not necessarily in line with the magisterium, even when they're active. So I appreciated that, and the, the last thing that I wanted to, to say about it was I've been in Vincentian formation for 35 years uh, on um, every level that you can, you can be in. I would just be real careful about paradigm shifts. You described the Jesuits. Uh, that was a very academic. In in the the new form of formation, there are four or five pillars of formation, and academic is only one, and often the least important. You can be a brilliantly educated person and not have any real formation, uh, and so we have to be very careful about how we understand that. So yeah. so that really points out how do we form Vincentians. Uh, and my one question for you is, is one experience definitive of Vincentian formation? So anyway, it's just a question. It's just a question. How, how deep are, is Vincentian formation when you self-identify because you've had an experience? So anyway, just, yeah. just a thought. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I think just a, a brief comment. I th for me, the, the Jesuit model, you're right, is you know, uh, significant. It's academic formation. But I pointed out just to say that um, this process of Jesuit formation leaves people professionally equipped to do this work over a lifetime. Now, formation is ongoing and lifelong, but I'm thinking of this group, when they go, they're highly educated, they're going out and they're getting masters on their own, and they're choosing career fields, in a sense, on their own. To what extent is this done in dialogue and in consultation with a mentor in the Vincentian family in a structured way? Um, so that's, I, I guess, you know, I should clarify what I... And I think we would say that a lot of formation happens in the seminary model because we get them out of the seminary and we get them into the uh, interaction with the poor. Some of the best formation is life. Uh, relationships are formative. Relationships with um, uh, falling in love is formative. All of these things. And so part of it is, has been the post-Vatican II formation is how do we get people out of the um, seminaries and into real life situations. I think that's already happening with the lay formation, with the lay Vincentians. Maybe they just need to articulate it and identify it more. Uh -huh. Better than what happens in seminaries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just a question. Uh, a lot of the respondents are uh, postgraduate volunteers, credit, mm -hmm. maybe did a year, maybe two years of service afterwards. And so a lot of the shifts, I think, saw were um, based on life circumstances and, and age. Um, do we have any information on what end of the range the respondents were? I mean, that's a big, 18 to 35 is, is a, a big shift in uh -huh. age range there. Um, I mean, were the majority of the uh, respondents just coming out of their postgraduate service or were Majority of them, you know, five years out, ten years out, maybe. Uh, I mean, do we have that information? Or? Yeah, there's a there's a breakdown of. Um, uh, I believe we have the dates of when they did their service. But this report um, is I have it in PDF. I'm happy to email it to anyone. Um, so it, it drills down significantly. So we have a lot of demographic background with that. But yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it, it is a big bucket, um, and. You know, having one service immersion experience as an undergraduate is different than five years after um, an intensive immersion experience, a professional degree, and a few years into a career. Um, and that's an important context. Yeah, one of the things that really caught my eye was that 
kind of affinity or affiliation with the Vincentian family, that idea of, you know, yes, I still carry this as part of, as a very important part of my practice and, and it looked like well, well, that, that affinity had kind of worn off of it, you know. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if that was uh, unique to the Vincentian family or if any of that research in that same group had been done with other religious orders that might offer um, postgraduate service opportunities. I'm thinking of like ACE through yeah. uh, Notre Dame or JVI or JVC or something like that, or even Lutheran Volunteer Corps or something. There's a big study of the Catholic Volunteer Network, uh, so we pulled out a sub-report of two Vincentian organizations uh, from that. So that might be a good place to look. Um, but I don't know, I, I'm sure the Jesuits have, I mean, I'm sure the study of the Jesuit volunteers has been done, I'm just not aware of it. Yeah, I was just wondering if it was unique or if it was... organizations because like as an alumni of Nepal it's super easy to stay connected but even I think in my career path I'm constantly trying to explain to my co-workers like oh well, this is what it means to be a conception and this is why I'm motivated to be a fundraiser and do what I do and they're like oh that's so neat like that's so cool that you have that formation and they're like well how are you still connected and I was like well I'm connected because I choose to be and I make an active choice every day to live in the way of an incension, but that's easy for me because I had four years of a very highly involved in the incension mission experience, but what, what about people who, maybe they did only one one surf submersion and then they graduated Paul and, and they're done, like what, what's like the follow-up for them? Because I think that's a big piece where you lose a lot of engaged people who are engaged during their experience, whether that be a volunteer year or their college career, and then afterwards it's like how do I keep myself motivated yeah. if you don't have a personal relationship with you know Father Ed or Sister Ray Beth or a bunch of the other like people who have impacted my life who still encourage me. Yeah well I think that's the challenge of a university-based model or a postgraduate volunteer based model because alumni are looking in the rearview mirror in a sense mm -hmm. it was their experience that happened in the past and I know this firsthand from my experience as a Jesuit volunteer. Um, they say you're ruined for life and then you fall off a cliff, but you know, in a positive way. You have this very formative experience, but then you're left on your own to find community. And in one sense, it's very organic. People do you know, find this social network, but in another sense, it's not very intentional in terms of a lifelong process of formation. And I think if there were a community that people could intentionally associate with, um, that would address that need significantly. Um, and I'm sure it could be in part university-based, but it can't be um, entirely university-based because DePaul looks on its alumni for different, yes. through a different lens, we'll say. <coughs> Francis. Oh, so do you know what uh, religious but not spiritual means? Religious but not <laughs> spiritual? <laughs> I, yeah, I that one baffles me. I don't, Maybe they worship uh, Justin Bieber. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
were they basing answering these questions on? I mean, is it like working in the food pantry, working in the coat drive? I mean, what specific things was the foundation for them uh, of their experience? Because I don't, I don't know what the. So on the. Um there's a, a network of postgraduate volunteer programs mm -hmm. that are what part of... What types of things do they do? In uh, they do lots of things, ranging from education to social service to health care and, and everything in between. Um, so this, these are uh, people who have been in postgraduate volunteer programs, so that's one sample. And the other one is DePaul programs, and we focused, we identified our highly engaged mission students. So we have, I think, three or four programs that we uh, we defined as highly engaged, and so those were the two so what two types populations. Of programs do they have? I'm, I'm not familiar with the right. you know, this well, like living in community, and they help out with the, with the soup kitchen, or they help feed people in the nursing homes, or what types of things do they do? Uh, yes, all of those things that you yeah. mentioned. Some of them are uh, service immersion trips, uh, domestic and abroad. And Scott, wouldn't be part of that be, because I think this is what I've heard from young uh, people who had great experiences of that, and then go to a visit to Paul conference in your parish and, you know, bedrooms. And part of that experience is that when they did that experience with DePaul with the students in your volunteer group or, um, you know, they, they talked about that experience and what it has meant to them. I, and I think that gets to your point, that what is formation? That, you know, formation has to touch the heart and get to the, you know, to the inner core of who you are. And that this service is a part of who you are and the why of why that service is a part of who you are. So I think one critical thing, at least in my experience of talking, young adults who have had these kinds of experiences is the value that they have had in being able to share faith and to share faith in the life of this service. That's, that's so I, I'm interested, Scott, in what is your next step. Are you going to tweak them to ask them more about what, what it is that they're looking for? And um, the second phase is going to be focus groups. So um, we're going to work, probably contract with Kara again, work with uh, Sister Patricia Whitberg. She's a sociologist of religion at IUPUI. Um, and so she's going to do uh, focus groups. Because uh, this is, is very useful, but graphs and charts can only get so far. And so we think focus groups are the, are the next step. Mm -hmm. um, th I, this is, is very interesting. It's good. Um, my question is, what do you want to happen out of this study? Like, if, if you had a dream in five years, this would occur. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're all worried. I mean, if you look at if you look at the numbers, they're disastrous in terms of religious life. You know, uh, it, it 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 just requires a, a different approach. I mean, just obvious there, um, but I think you're right to, to to think in terms of opportunity. And then, so it, it would seem to me to be the question. Uh, none of the statistics I found surprising, um, although I think the Latino factor is a big one. That DePaul should look at in terms of the um, But if 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 all this study and then people in this room were we're worried about this, which I think we all are. Um, what what would happen? Like, what would be what should happen in five or ten years to say, well, this is what we talked about, and we did these things, and here's what happened, and it worked. What would it be? Um, I don't know that there's any one specific thing other than world peace or the end of poverty or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the big one. That's, that's the big, big picture. Yeah, maybe a little too big. But I, I think a, a couple of things. One would be for this group of unaffiliated lay of incentives to feel as if they are part of a community of incentives. Mm -hmm. To be connected. To be connected. Yeah. Whether that's formal on the high end, like a you know, third mm -hmm. order, yeah. 
or maybe the Vincentian family daughters and Vincentians invite unaffiliated lay Vincentians into their communal life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for regular prayer or service. I mean, service is what people want to do. They want to work. Yeah, that's obvious. So to work side by side, I think, with daughters and Vincentians would be a phenomenal opportunity. Um, and a third thing, um, I, in this conversation with Father Ed, he, he's fascinated by the, um, the DePaul USA model. So they focus, DePaul International focuses on homelessness and DePaul USA. What would it look like to have that institutional focus on a concrete social reality and invite people into that work and then see that as a context for long-term formation and belonging? I think that's the way to go. Um, because I think people get attracted <clears throat> to doing something. Uh -huh. And then the formation and the inspiration and, you know, the Bible, read the Bible, all this stuff comes after. Yeah. And um, so, like, when, I'm, when, when I was listening to you, I was thinking, well, Vincent, Vincent and Louise already gave us the answer. Um, it's that we, that there has to be more concrete opportunities for people who work directly with the poor. And, and that, um, that's what will get people to take a look at all this stuff that we're talking about in a more serious way because um, I think, and I think Vincent de Paul thought, people are made in such a way that when they work with the poor, they like it, and they know that it is good. And um, and so that when they go down that road, uh, they're going to be attracted to it. And um, so, so in one sense, it's like when you're talking, I'm thinking, well, yeah, we should have five soup kitchens within a square mile. And that the Paul students should, I, I know it happens at the church and so on, but to, to just to replicate that, I feel like Vincent and Louise's house is great. I just saw a bunch of the students last night doing stuff. And it, it almost seems like more of that. Like Bill and Mary Jaster in Denver, they, they do that. And I saw the red spot in Denver, which yeah. I'm going to do tomorrow. And, um, and it seems to me that that's some sort of a replication along the lines that, that Vincent and Louise already set forth is exactly the opportunity, and you couldn't you couldn't imagine a better pope in the last 500 years than the one we have now for you know like a rationale. And just a quick on the yeah. uh, on the DePaul USA model, I think what intrigues me about that is this isn't just charismatic formation. This is also professional formation. So if people in this organization see the possibility of an advanced degree and a career and a life devoted to this work, what does that look like? And that there's a, an opportunity within this international network focusing on homelessness. I mean, it's just, it's intriguing. Carl. I think a little, of, you know, when we've done, I work in university ministry and some of our um, alum serving that we've done five, 10 years out, and students have had a you know, profound experience of service immersion or some kind of ongoing experience in a, you know, some kind of residential setting that has an intentional community, they will be using terms like they found a sense of belonging. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> so one recommendation through the focus groups is as soon as possible, can we find a new name that is not unaffiliated lay and sanctioned? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think I'll figure out where I'm going to be. You know, because if this is a more holistic therapeutic group, right. I don't know what I'm about. this is an emerging branch or another new expression, yeah. Yeah. of our Vincentian family in the world, yeah. what's, what's a way we can, you know, for those students who graduate self-identifying as Vincentians from DePaul University, now you are. Yeah. In yeah. In this is kind of a dissertation title. It's just, it's so descriptive that there's no ambiguity. <laughs> right. yeah. Not very good for uh, naming it. Yeah. yeah. So um, how do you prevent that, though, from just being, um, uh, caught in kind of generic volunteerism, volunteerism and not kind of making that extra step. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, talking about Vincent is a way to avoid talking about Jesus, right, or about God. And when Mike was 
were talking a minute ago, it was like, you know, when you encounter poor people, you just have this sense that there's something, and I thought he was going to say that there's something sort of godly in that encounter, but he stopped short and said there's something really good about this. And I mean, that, that, can, that can go on anywhere, and it seems to me like Vincent would want to say, yeah, ultimately this is something that leads people to God, that you can't just sort of eliminate God from this because it's embarrassing for millennials to talk about that or sacramental life. Um, and clearly that's not what you're after. So I guess the question is, what do you, how do you make that, that connection? Yeah. You know, how, do you not, how do you not just stop talking about seeing Jesus and the poor and just translate that into some other kind of language? The, I don't know if you know the, the kickoff um, for um, the uh, immersion week, or the, the service day um, this year, had a um, Frederick Buechner's quote up about um, vocation. What's how does the quote go? Vocation I mean, is the place where the world's greatest need meets your passion. Right. Yeah. Where the world's needs meets meets your deepest longings, or something like that. Except they had just changed the word vocation to the word purpose without kind of making any notation about that. And I thought. Good Lord, is this where we've come to? You know that you any, anything that sounds sort of religiony, you have to kind of you know excise it, you know excise it and change it into something you know something else. Um, so how do you how do you prevent that from happening? How do you how do you make that connection? Yeah, um, I think part of it is coming up with new language to talk about this. Um, so I try in my classes, I talk about the mission-centered horizon um, as a way of describing this in terms of ultimate meaning and um, search for purpose and all of this without cheapening uh, the theological concepts that are at work. But I think, I think it's difficult to do among people who do not have a theological education that when Vincent says encountering Christ in the poor, what, what does he mean? What does that mean theologically? What does that mean anthropologically? Um, and I think that's where the work needs to be done, um, to create these categories that are open and available to people who don't self-identify as Christian. But I keep wondering, what does Vincent look like from a Torah-centric perspective? We, we have students here who will tell you that. Uh -huh. They'll say, I'm a Jewish Vincent, or you know, I'm a Muslim Vincent. Now, St. John's will be shocked by that because that's not the way they know Vincent. But I think we've been trying to work on this for 15 plus years. What does it mean in a pluralistic world to say you're a Vincentian? And like, I think the first step has to be intentionality that we've shied away from before. So we've gone for like the lowest common denominator, everyone likes service, or the vast majority of people. So let's have a service experience where you have an aha moment and you can reflect on it. But I know when I came here, there were very few resources in terms of even the Vincentian narratives. Like, why is this even important? So even finding out what those are and then finding a language that people can see themselves in is really important. Um, so what we've tried to do is create a, a project called, well, project not the right word, but a formation methodology that we call VIA, which is Vincentians in action, um, that people can see themselves in, that doesn't water that down. Yeah. But allows you to find your place in it. But but it's difficult. Like I think like if I think about the Jesuits, I was a Jesuit volunteer. There's a lot more material there to play with than asking, having tea with a Vincentian and saying, talk to me about this experience of this article. So but intentionality I think has to be that first step. Um, yeah. and and connecting that strong experience that happens when you are serving people who are marginalized with the Vincentian pieces is essential. Um, I don't know, we always do that very well. Yeah. Um, thank you for your sharing. Uh, my question would be a lot around the nature of the research, and I really wanted to ask the, the question Mike has asked earlier, what is this for? And it, it seems like uh, I figure out that it's like a school-based research, and where the alumni are and what they did and in one way or the other, those connected with this too. So 
my question is, uh, I think you did research on, on Niagara and, and St. John's, people connected with them, and mainly Depot. Uh, is there a phase four or phase three somewhere that you can, that you can include Adamson University? Ah. Which is like the fourth university, the fourth Vincentian University all over the world. I mean, yeah. there are just four universities, and uh -huh. I come from Adamson yeah. in Manila, and would this be replicated somewhere there, uh -huh. or around the area? Because I'm thinking, maybe this is just beyond one school. It's like a research for, for the Vincentian family, and where young people and affiliated, she said, uh, who have experiences in any of our institutions. It could be a school institution, but it could also be like uh, institutions of the Daughters of Charity. So would, would this include, in, in the future, would this include this, these areas? Uh, and because that would connect to how, how does this research relate with, for instance, an, the international movement of young people called the JMV? Uh, young uh, yeah, yeah. which which is also doing volunteer work uh, affiliated with the Vincentians uh, and, uh, and how does this what uh, these the results connect with them sure how, how because that would be like also include European countries uh, or Latin American countries or Misevi uh, there are a lot of young people volunteering in the missions which are not school-based, uh, which fee, who feel that they're also affiliated with the Vincentians. Uh, yet, uh, I don't know if this is in the panorama of that research. So I, I, I'm looking to, into DePaul because of the four universities, I think, the three ones that are in the US, and they're the most uh, capable of doing this research in service for the worldwide Vincentian family. So would that include that vision? I don't know. Amy. Um, well, just to be clear, this is half undergraduate. The other half is Miss Evie. Uh, so this isn't just a university-based, uh, you know. I, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's roughly those are the two sample populations. Um, I think it would be really important um, for the Vincentian family to invest in this research. Um, I think the context of Adamson in the Philippines is significantly different from the context of millennial Catholics in the United States here. So this is well outside my area of competence. Um, so I think uh, the more people that look at this, the better. Um, and then just to comment on the Vincentian Mary and Youth, um, Yasmin Kajus who was president of VMY, uh, she was here doing her graduate work. Um, her experience is VMY ends at about 18. So we're looking for this gap between 18 to almost the Society of St. Vincent de Paul or Ladies of Charity. And there's a significant gap in very formative decades of a person's life, namely 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, but the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, at least in the US, um, many people come to this work in retirement. Um, and so we're looking at people entering their careers um, you know, in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. But I, the point's well taken. I think you're absolutely right that, that this would be a, a worthwhile research project. One, one last comment I would have as a CM is in terms of the beginning of your uh, uh, presentation and coming out of that vision about where the CMs are in the United States, uh -huh. one of the challenges is that um, not all CMs uh, are from the Midwest. Uh -huh. And that that context that was presented was a very Midwest vision by a CM in the sense that the, the answer to the call is if you look at our faculty here, our faculty is recruited from, I've met Nigerians, I've met Kenyans, in fact, I met a faculty member who's in Tanzania doing classes online. We have this beautiful international, well, the, the, this vision is the typical Midwest of Vincentians of, we're, this is us, this is who we're here. There's no sense of the international uh, issue yeah. that, if you open DePaul, the CMs open DePaul up and said, we're going we're gonna to invite educated, brilliant women and men, daughters and CMs from all over the world. We have so many CMs here that th that vision is as if we have to do it all ourselves rather than the international vision. So you're right about the Hispanic issue. Um, since 1935, all priests in Los Angeles have had to learn Spanish as a second language. Since 1935. 
here and it, 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 you know. So anyway, it's just a different vision. I bring that in after only being here a year to see how different the church is here than what I experienced in so many other places. Well, thanks. I think we need to um, let Scott get some lunch. <laughs> no, but uh, let's, let's thank Scott.